Welcome to Date with Danu. Today is a very interesting show. And in 2022, we have made history in Sri Lanka in creating a village, in creating a voice, in creating a protest that has nearly held on for a month. And everyone seems to be wanting the same thing, and that is a new parliament to run this country, or a new set of leaders. But to speak more about it, of course, I wanted to bring in people who have represented the youth, done work in changing the mindset of the youth, and also have been understanding the pulse of Sri Lanka and what it's going to face as we move on with years. So let's welcome our guests on the show. I'm happy to have Prashant Divisa and Kavin Yepin. and researcher by training. Um, I'm also the founder of um, an organization called Tilly, uh, where we focus on the cognitive development of children between the ages of 5 and 10. Hi, my name is Prashant Divizar. I had the privilege of leading Sri Lanka Unites and Global Unites, the youth movements for reconciliation. I think we're here at a very monumental time in our country's history, at a time and place and movement that many people in our generation haven't seen. Um, and I think we're here to talk about, at least I'm here to talk about uh, the role of education, what we can do as educators uh, to really take this movement uh, beyond golf phase to classrooms and schools. We're here at a historical time in our country's history. Uh, young people, especially the ones even younger than us, are uh, doing incredible work uh, to help transform the country, to create a new political culture. I just want to talk about the inspiring things uh, they're doing and what we can learn as a country. As a Welcome to the show and today we wanted to speak about the very famous Gota Go Gama which has been making waves not only in Sri Lanka, internationally across the world we have been spoken about. I think it's the first time that the people have stepped out for such a long period of time apart from religion, religious leaders, uh, all types of people on the streets asking for the same thing. Uh, so I want to speak to the two of you, thank you for being here. Uh, Prashan, I know this is your second time. And Carvin, that's your first time on the show. Thank you for being here. And I told Prashant, I'm so happy I have people, I have friends who I can call and speak about these things too because they have been there, they have seen it and they saw it lo long, long time ago. Let's speak about this concept called go to go home, Gama. Um, you were in the US during this time and you have come down. Uh, tell me what has been the feedback there in the US? I think... Um just to clarify, we are obviously not here to represent the voices of the young people who are at golf phase right now, but also across districts. Um, it's not just what's happening in golf phase, it's, it's happening across districts. Um, I'm from Kegol, I live in an area called Daraniagal. Young people are coming up and protesting and talking. She came straight from there. <laughs> I <Yeah>. did. <laughs> off the bus. Yeah. Off the bus. Off Didn't the get bus. kicked out of the bus, yeah. but came off the bus. And I think just to... Uh, talk a little bit about what's happening beyond Sri Lanka of uh, diaspora communities, expat communities coming up and talking. I think this is the first time that people who are extremely privileged, who have lived abroad, and also people who are not so privileged, who have contributed so much to the economy of the country, bringing remittances into the country, are coming out and speaking and asking, what has happened to the money we've sent to this country? What, what have you been doing with our hard-earned money? Um, what's the future of this country? Why are our family members in long queues? Why can't our children afford medicine? What is happening? And I think we've never seen that among diaspora communities, among expats, among uh, Sri Lankans living abroad, uh, like myself, uh, working for foreign companies, really coming out and saying, this is our country. We need to have a country to come back to. Uh, maybe our leaders don't need a country to come back to, but we need a country to come back to. Because both of you had chance, you, both of you have still have a chance to just pack up and go and like settle down in other countries, but you choose to somehow one day make it here. Um, internationally, this protest or this voice that the people have brought forward, what are they saying about the consistency of nearly a month 
We're talking about the 31st of March when things were at the president's house entrance to what it is today. Uh, tell me about what are they saying? I think from communities in the United States, in Europe, in Australia, wherever there are Sri Lankans, in Geneva, whatever country you take, uh, Dubai, they're all coming out and saying the same thing. They want um, the president to resign. They want Gota to go home, and that's the collective voice. And I think it is because our Sri Lankans here are the ones who have to deal with it day in and day out. Uh, expat communities like myself, we're not standing in queues. We don't have to go to a, a hospital and realize there's no morphine to treat our father or brother who's just gone through a surgery. Uh, we don't have to worry about figuring out our next meal. And seeing Sri Lankans, despite having to go through all of that in their day to day, consistently coming into their towns, coming to golf areas, uh, coming into their village centers and, and screaming and asking for a change, asking for the president to resign, asking for a better tomorrow and a better leadership in this country, I think that's what's fooling all the protests going on. And I think in the US, there's something that's going to happen across all mm. states. Yeah. Uh, this has never happened before. That is true. Uh, Prashant, I would like to speak to you a little bit about this statement, Go Home Gota, considering the fact that we are looking at funding from IMF and other people who are kind enough to sort of mm. bring us back to some kind of position. And they all need a running government, uh, a parliament that is not going to be like breaking up in like a few days. When they are looking out for a stable body to govern this country, asking the president to leave, is it a good move or is it a bad move from an understanding of where you stand and with your education? Well, first of all, thank you for having us. And I also want to start with what the Kavindya said, uh, is that you know we are inspired by this younger generation who've taken leadership. None of us can, there's nobody who can speak for these young people. But just listening and watching them, there's so much for us to learn. This is a generation that did something about their grievance. They are, they are changing history right now. So I'm extremely inspired by them um, for over 17 days now, out there doing amazing things. So we're learning from them, and we're just here to uh, learn from that and also be inspired from that for generations to come that civil society, citizens in general, will be active and engaged. In regards to what the people are asking, I think it's very clear. They want the president to resign. They want the president's family to resign. And uh, I, I've heard, heard this thing of, well, will that cause instability at a moment like this? But when you look at a country and what we've been through in the last two years, so many horrible decisions that have affected the economy, that have hurt the people. Many times, local experts and international experts say, do not do this. This will have negative repercussions to your country, whether it was the fertilizer ban, whether it was uh, tax reductions and, and so many things. The moment it happened, there were red flags all over. But there was this arrogant desire to do as that was pleased that's caused so much pain. So in that context, people are saying we're supposed to make so many critical decisions for our country from now onwards. We're at the worst economic state we've ever been as a nation. And right now, we, it's more risky and more unstable to have the same leadership that made those bad decisions continue to be there because we can't afford any more mistakes right now. And especially just about two weeks ago when the president said, none of this was because of my fault. So if you're ignorant to the level of mistakes you've done, and then about a week later said, yeah, some of these decisions were wrong, you can't go back and forth right now. You need clear, intelligent leadership that's willing to listen to the experts and take things forward. At the same time, the political culture that has been created by the president and the family has been toxic to the nation. Nepotism, rampant corruption, toxic race, nationalism, that's, um, these issues are going to continue to cripple the nation. So there's no stability in that. And even the international community have major concerns about these things. So will it cause instability? I don't think so. I think it's a much needed thing. When you take a cancer patient, most doctors say you first have to take the tumor out. Mm. You can't do chemotherapy and all sorts of nourishment to help the patient and hope that the patient will be stable. The tumor has to go out. And in my opinion, the president and the family have been a tumor to the country. They've been feeding off the country. They've been getting strengthened by it. They have not been helping the country. And therefore, the tumor has to be taken out for a stable, prosperous, thriving Sri Lanka in the years to come. For those who are watching, you may wonder, why am I speaking to these two? What do they exactly do? We are going to clari uh, clarify that when we do come back. Do stick around. It's safe to Welcome back to the show. So at the initial start, I said I have two people who represent the youth.
but they have something to add to that statement. So I'm going to ask you guys, what do you exactly do? And I want to tell the people as to why I wanted to have you here. So I'm going to first let you all speak about your contribution to the society over the years. Um, I think for me, I'll, I'll tell a bit about what I do. I've worked in education for the past uh, almost six years. I've worked with both youth groups as well as this age category of five to ten. And I think something I see in this current context is the lack of civic education. We are in a democracy, but we don't know how to vote smart. If I were to ask somebody, do you know the members of parliament who are representing you, your district, in parliament right now, do you know who they are or even a list? A lot of people are not aware of that. And I think um, at one part of the problem is how do we restructure our classrooms? How do we restructure uh, early childhood education to make sure we build a generation of people who are able to vote smart, people who are aware of their civic responsibility, people who can hold these members of parliament accountable, and people who realize that the government is working for us. We are paying their salary. Uh, their agenda should be our agenda. Their agenda should be the people's agenda. But these changes don't ha happen over time. At the core of it is how we restructure the education system to create that cultural change. And I think uh, that's sort of the area and environment I come in from. And I think that's the angle that I'm looking at in what's going on in the protest And right one of now. the most smartest people in Sri Lanka who has got scholarships after scholarship, who is, who has studied with, uh, who is right now with the uh, University of... Uh, Stanford. Yeah. And I think... And you top the grade in Sri Lanka. I just have to say this. And also she's a neighbors to Mark. Like Mark, like... Like Daru keeps saying this all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, like meta mark. <laughs> yeah. But I think one thing to also add to that is, we, as, as Prashant was rightly saying, there's no one voice of the youth. Mm -hmm. Even if you go to golf, there are young there's people so from many every, every single district, and all of them have united on one point, which is asking Gotabe Rajapaksha to get the hell out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, it's a very clear ask. I don't know yes. why he doesn't get it, but yes. I'll, I'll leave it to Prashant yeah, yeah. to tell a bit about what he does. Yeah, so... Actually, first of all, once again, when you talk about youth, we have 9 million people technically under the age of 35 in this country. So there's no one group that can speak for all 9 million people. And at the same time, like Harvin was saying, you go to Gota Gogama and Golf Face in general, so many different voices, but they're uniting under one clear banner. Message, yeah. One clear message is the president and his family have to go. They have hit the nail right on the head. They said this is where change has to begin. And yeah. if you could... Just a background about Prashan. Yeah. Uh, he's the founder of uh, Sri Lanka Unites, a youth-led organization for hope and reconciliation, and also uh, right now heading Global Unites, mm -hmm. which is an international organization that connects a lot of countries who have used this model called Sri Lanka Unites to create changes uh, and bring in goodness at a grassroots level in many, many countries across yeah. the world. So. Yeah, so on, on Sri Lankan front as well, for the longest time, we feel one of the biggest issues we have as a country is that we don't have an inclusive Sri Lankan identity, where every Sri Lankan, regardless of their ethnicity, their religion, or their socioeconomic background, could truly say, I am a first-class citizen, I'm treated as an equal, and that I have a future. That has not been resolved as a country. We have been blinded by triumphalistic nature of the, after the war that we haven't healed the hearts of our citizens. Mm. And so it's up to this new generation to help bring us together to create a strong Sri Lankan identity so we can build a future that all our children can be proud of. Mm. And we have to work for that. We can't divide and... So that's what politicians more often than not would do. If the culture has been divide and rule. Let's pit them against each other on religion, on ethnicity blatantly. And they've been aided by certain media organizations that have helped that culture. And then people vote blindly as opposed to voting intelligently saying, can this person deliver? Are they intelligent? Are they transparent? Are they competent? None of those questions are asked, oh, that person's my religion, my ethnicity, and seems to be for me, so I'll vote for them. And this is the mess we get, a bankrupt nation. Congratulations. So we have to say, the next generation needs to come together. And that's been our message to Sri Lankan. How do we come together? How do we identify each other's grievances and aspirations and work together towards So nobody that? is going to check whether you are a singular Tamil Muslim, Burger Malay, when they choose somebody to the parliament, but is this person fit enough to serve this country? And that's the only, only question that needs to be asked before that. Uh, something that I wanted to ask was, in terms of this statement uh, recently that was brought in saying, okay, maximum we have 500,000 people at uh, Gota Gogama, mm -hmm. but the rest of the country is still for, uh, and later on we sort of saw a lot of 
uh, protests and different types of statements being made in different areas of our country. But there's still a very handful of people, and we're talking about a majority of 22, nearly 22 million people. Do you think they all represent the same, same voice? I think what I feel is that, Prashant, this whole sentiment that we're seeing, a lot of these, uh, I would say, the pro-government voices or the pro, uh, pro-Rajapaksha pro voices that are coming out, it's a very Colombo-centric mindset, I feel. Um, personally, if you go out into the districts, if you go out of the, the sort of the radius of Colombo, people have been standing in queues forever. Mm. People are going to hospital and they don't have basic medicine. There are premature born babies who don't have basic vials that they need to go and survive for the next couple of weeks. People have now, they're really experiencing the terrible decisions that both Gotha Bay Rajapaksha and his cabinet has been making and his family has been making uh, since, since his election and since their tenure. And I think when people feel that in their every day, this is what's uniting them to one voice. And I think... This, this idea that, oh, it's just, a, it's just a bunch of young people, or I there was a very famous uh, television station that basically built this cult personality around Gotha Bay that came and called uh, the people's protest a carnival. Mm. And I think it's this kind of mentality of not listening to the people and questioning the, the, the voice of the people and the sentiments of the people that got us into this mm. mess in the first yeah. place. And I think people really need to open their eyes. Um, and realize that this is this is one voice. People are uniting against this one voice, and they're asking for one very simple thing: they're asking Gota Bear and the entire family to go home to resign. We need to speak about where we have gone wrong with this protest. Don't jump into conclusions. We'll speak when we do come back. Do stick around. This day to come. Welcome back. Where did the protests go wrong? Now, we do know a lot of names that have been used. It could be musicians, it could be personalities who have been told, unfollow their page. They are the ones who have created this. Uh, artists who have lost thousands of followers on Instagram, social media. What is your viewpoint on it? Well, first of all, I know some people can get hurt on social media and attack and all that, but let's also talk about people who are hurting. The family who is mourning their father in Rambukkana right now. Uh, the people who are so in abject poverty right now. Not, no, so there is some serious, significant pain. Yes, social media and things like that, that's one thing, but I, I want to call on that. But at the same time, let's talk also, I don't think we talk enough about the positives that have happened as a result of this generation standing up. Up to this point, we've had over 75% of a nation's budget governed by one family. Today, it's very little. All of them had to resign. We had cabinet ministers with allegations of massive scale corruption have had to leave their positions. We've had a central bank governor and a monetary board that was printing money as if they were children in a toy shop and they bankrupt the nation. They're no longer at the helm. We had a finance minister who supposedly had seven brains but didn't seem to show any and was going to go represent us at the IMF and the World Bank and all at this crucial juncture, not doing that anymore. There has been some significant victories non-violently by this generation standing up and many more victories. And now there's a talk of repealing the 20th Amendment, something that we thought was impossible, a talk of actually abolishing the presidency being plausible. So these are major victories and there are so many more. And so I think we should talk about that as well. But yes, people have to be held accountable because people like yeah, this generation is asking questions. What went wrong? How were we brainwashed to be pitted against each other along ethnic and religious lines? And they're asking people, media stations to individuals, to people saying, you sold this to us in some way, shape or form. And they will say stuff. Not everybody's accountable for what everyone's saying, but those are just some elements. But there are much larger things at play. Uh, speaking about personal agendas, I think every, every government body comes with a bit of a background team supporting them. Mm -hmm. And it could be media, it could be business leaders or companies. All of these people right now are staying quiet or not being seen out there. What do you say to those people? And uh, as some, both of you who have worked in media, what is your take on media taking a side? I think the general premise of journalists is that you, you report facts and you report the truth and never take a side and you sort of bring evidence so that you give, present it to people for them to take an informed uh, a critical thinking sort of standpoint and make a judgment for yourself 
And that's what media stations stand for. But let's take a step back and look at the political landscape of this country. In Sri Lanka, this consciousness that's coming about is people realizing that there is a business, media, political mafia that works together. It is this mafia that then brings regimes like the Rajapaksha regime into power, brings incompetent megalomaniacs like Gotabe Rajapaksha, like Mahindra Rajapaksha into power. The reason why they do that is because they know if you bring this type of people who have no, um, no ethics, no values, uh, no expertise, that they can easily make a buck out of tenders. They can easily uh, cut across the red tape. They can easily uh, you know, launder the money that they've always been laundering. And I think it's these organizations and individuals that are now being held accountable. And I think the biggest rise of consciousness that I've seen in the people, Dano, is that people are asking, who owns our media? In Sri Lanka, it's 33 individuals, give or take a few, that owns all the media stations in this country, news, print, uh, digital, etc. 33 individuals who have the power to decide what kind of information we consume and whose agenda we consume. If you take Gotabe Rajapaksha, his entire personality, this man is like a one-person guy whose personality was built to a 95%, built by a advertising agency, pushed by a, um, a group of media stations, uh, why? Because they made a cut out of tenders. <coughs> and this is what people are questioning. These individuals have to be held accountable. And I think with this consciousness of people questioning who funded this parliamentarian's campaign, mm -hmm. we have no campaign finance laws in this country. Anybody can give any amount of money, and then these people go into parliament, the decisions they make, the policies they take, aren't going to benefit the three of us or the general public of this country. But it's to like the three... Uh, uh, companies or the three business people who funded their campaign and this is what people are questioning and I think this is this is one of the key points where citizenry is going to be so vast so critical and that's mm. exactly what we need yeah. people have to be held accountable now we always tell that Sri Lankans are they quick they're quick to forget and they're quick to move on the smallest carrot that's dangled in front of them they tend to just forget about everything that has happened uh, we always wait for a world cup moment for our gas prices to go up and you know it has always been covered under something interesting so we don't tend to realize it and see it do you think this time around that will happen or it will not happen I think there is a shift taking place. It's yet to be seen. It's early stages, but there is a cultural shift, especially among the younger generation. You're seeing more and more of a desire to now be active citizens. No longer take a break and come back and see the whole thing at a mess. Ask questions. Like, I think Transparency International Sri Lanka does an amazing job of asking our parliamentarians to declare their assets publicly. Take away the secrecy clause. Come and declare it publicly. Show that you haven't been benefiting of People's and for money. now, how many people in parliament have actually declared Only publicly? 10. Yeah. 10 out of 225. What are you hiding? Hmm. Why can't you say, this is how I made my honest money? How did these guys become multi-million dollar people when they didn't have uh, no inheritance, no professional entrepreneurial you know, exploits that show that this is how they got their money, but they're some of the wealthiest in the region. So now people are asking these questions. They're saying, audit all 225 plus the president, everybody. They're saying, audit all these firms around them. Audit all these companies around them. This is, they want change. Because what's happened now is, when you take our debt as a nation, external debt, at 51 billion US dollars. And we skyrocketed from 2009, 2005. Five, yeah. And that's where we started going up. In 2005, our external debt was 11 billion US dollars. Today is 51 billion, 40 billion dollars in this state, and most of the time was this family at the helm. Only four years, somebody else. But regardless, these people are saying, when we take our external debt and we take the allegations of the funds that have been stolen or questions about, it's far greater than the actual debt. So nationalize these assets. If you can't declare it and show how the heck you got this money, it's the people's money. Don't let the poor mother suffer and not feed her children. Don't let another generation be destroyed. We're talking about the common man in this country. They're hurting. And they're not asking for wealth and riches. They just don't want to have to suffer. And so these leaders have to leave. Why don't you come out and why haven't none of the Rajapaksha family ever declared their assets? Why can't you come out and say, I declare it publicly? Why is the secrecy clause? And why don't you at least pay back the people right now? That's what they're asking for. We are not a nation that should be in debt. We're a thriving country with so much resources, so much potential, so much intelligent individuals. But government has failed. Politicians have failed. 
and now people are not going to let this go easily. I've been watching, you know, some of these kids are there every day. Yeah. It's exhausting. It's not only here, in Gaul, in Andhradapura, in so many places. It's exhausting in this scorching heat with very little to eat. They're, they're there because they want change. Because it's their future at stake. And most of these kids are not leaving the country. Even if they had a visa, they're not. This is their country. They're saying, my country, my children's future, I'm going to fight for it. Non-violently, and I'm not going to forget. And so I hope that will be the reality because that's what's needed. Citizens have to wake up. You can't just outsource your responsibility to career politicians and say, you hold them accountable, I'm going to take a snap. Because they have deals with each other and they will not hold anybody accountable. But this whole allegation of thinking, not allegation, but this worry of would this one day become a bloodbath? Now this has been something that has been put in people's mind. Do you think there are chances? Do you think there will be an external force that could come in? What would you tell to those who are at these protests? I think that I know this question of a bloodbath, we have a president and a family and several members of parliament who've had massive consistent allegations of murdering our own citizens. You know, from the trink of five to what's happening in Ratup what happened in Ratapaswala to the Easter Sunday attacks, either of not being able to bring uh, the perpetrators to justice or obstructing justice or allegations of murder. And I don't think that we can, we have to anticipate any more of a bloodbath because we've been in the midst of a bloodbath for the past several years from the war because nobody won the war. Mothers in the North and South are still screaming. The Easter Sunday attacks, um, the number of families we lost, children without fathers, mothers who had to see their children die on their own hands. We have been in the midst of a bloodbath and our, and our leaders and our president hasn't been able to bring perpetrators to justice. And they also have allegations of murder. And I think, I don't know what more of a bloodbath we yeah. could wait for, anticipate. We're already in it. If you're wondering where, where do their passion come from? Where does it come from? We're going to speak more and answer this when we do come back. And also something that's very, very important, our constitution from the 70s till now, it has gone through 20 changes. Do we actually need the changed constitution? Or do we just need a brand new one? We'll speak more when we do that. Welcome back to the show. The Naked Truth right here on Date with Danu. We're speaking to Kavin Devenakon and Prashant Divisa. You can always look them up for more details on who they are and how much they have done towards our country. Uh, I want to speak about where this passion comes from. Why are you so proud that this country is where you're from and you want to always keep the flag flying high. Um, I'm the same. <laughs> Unfortunately, we, we now suffer trying to pump fuel to a car. We cry about those. We had opportunity to set free from this country, coming from all types of uh, unfortunate situations, the war to everything. Uh, we could have easily taken a pass out of this country. But for some odd reason, you just, you are, this Sri Lanka is a drug. You just want to stay here and like be here and be a part of this uh, island home. But not everyone sees it as a place where we need to grow with the country. It's just you grow by yourself and the country can just fall apart. Tell me, what brought you here? Why do you think the way you think? I think for me, um, I'm sure I've, I've shared this story with you before as well. Um, I think I come from a family, my father died because he spoke the truth. Um, he was uh, chief jail at the Valicata prison at the time of his death. Uh, he was the officer who had caught the largest amount of heroin in the country at the time. Uh, he believed that whoever passed us through the Valicata prison doors was equal, whether he was um, a, a drug criminal from Maligavato who grew up in poverty or whether it was a minister um, who was caught for some corruption allegation or a sexual ha harassment scandal. He believed that all of these uh, prisoners should be treated equal. And uh, he also cracked down the sort of the, the drug cartels that were running from inside prisons because it's a known secret drug cartels happen from inside the prison. Drug lords want to come into the prison. And uh, he was shot dead because he believed in doing what was right. He believed in speaking truth to power. And I think the only thing that I could do uh, to be of justice to his story and what he stood up for is to use whatever power I have um, to, to speak truth to power, to uh, sort of build a next generation as an educator, somebody who works with children and young people, to build that level of critical thinking, to build that level of consciousness. Fear never crossed your mind? To speak um, your mind in a country where 
speaking your mind could put you in trouble? I think uh, one of the first moments when I actually felt fear was uh, the, the disappearance of uh, journalist Pragit Eknaligoda. Pragit's uh, son was a good friend of mine. And it was the first time I realized what it meant to have people in power disappear or your own father. And I think if mothers in the north have no fear, if mothers in the south have no fear, or, or fear, families of journalists like Lasanta, like Pragi, journalists in the north have no fear, I think we're very small people compared to what they've been through. Um, we're very, very tiny people. We are not taking risks at all. Uh, we're in such privileged bubbles. And I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, we're very small people. And if they don't have fear, this is the least we can do. Krishan, what, what drove you into fighting for everything that is right and for pinning that flag so proudly always? Like Harvinder, like you and everybody here, I deeply love my country. I love the beauty of our diversity as a people. Not just the beauty of the country, when you look at the country, but the beauty of the people. I love from the Singhala Buddhist culture to the Tamil Hindu culture to the Muslim Sri Lankan culture to the Christians and the Catholic culture. There is something unique here. Four of the greatest religions in the world coexisting side by side and could be far greater when we come together. There is something about the younger generation. They're more bold than I could ever be. And I see that I'm inspired by them. I've worked with young people for the last 15 years. I've I've traveled the whole country at least seven times. He has actually districts. grown old by working with the young. I, yeah. <laughs> that is yeah. true. Yeah. I love to seeing them and saying that they are worth fighting for. They deserve better. And they will take us to greater heights. And you know, it's pointless talking about this when we are 60s and when it's too late to start something. We have to start now. And, and so that they inspire me. And you know, whatever we have done, this country has given us more. We're never leaving. Hmm. How much have we been blessed to be in this country? And we're not leaving, we're not sucking out everything the country can give us, from free education to everything, and now saying, nothing more to suck, we're out of here. No, we'll stay here and fight. And that means I have a responsibility as a father now, that when my children are adults, that they won't turn around and say, why the heck didn't you leave? I want to make sure that by the time they're adults, the country is in a place that they're also proud and they believe that they need to build from there. So we have a responsibility. And the same is, we are privileged. Maybe because we speak English, we have education and opportunities, we can lead. But what about the poorest of the poor? What about the families in Muleti, with Monaragal, in places like that? They have nowhere else to go. And so if we were blessed with education... And they don't even know that they have an option of going. And we need to fight and ensure that their rights are also met. We stand with them. We may not be able to understand all the depth of the pain that they are going through, but we need to make sure that we serve. We are committed to these people. And we are one as a country. And we deserve better. Our country deserves better. And that's why we are here. And that's why we're passionate. And I also believe we can change this country. And we have to start now. Let's speak about the Constitution. It's uh, quite an interesting piece of paper, I think. It, is, like, it has gone through more correction than my own O-level maths paper. It, is, it, has, it has seen it all. Uh, from the 70s, it has been rolling around with change after change after change. 19th, 20th, we have all seen it. And we have always been confused as to what these changes are doing for us. Is it the benefit of the country? Is it, is it something that's progressing our people towards betterment? Do you feel that the Constitution in total should be taken off and a brand new Constitution should be brought in? I really don't know the technicality about it. Is it something that's, that you can do it or you can always just amend? Mm -hmm. What is your take on this? Now, we are looking at a 20, uh, 21st. 21st, 21st Amendment. Please, tell me more about it. Okay. Neither of us are constitutional lawyers, right. Right. So, but, but one thing is very clear, that our constitution has not had the right checks and balances. The executive presidency was a disaster, and every president has come in saying they're going to abolish it, but they haven't. Power has corrupted. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we have created this structure, and it has to go. And so until and unless that's removed, there's going to be so many problems that come out of it. So at the very least, and then what happened was 19th Amendment made important changes. It wasn't perfect, but the 20th Amendment took us back so far. And we're seeing the repercussions of it. There was no checks and balances. People could do as they pleased, and they destroyed the country. So now that has to be changed immediately. You cannot have all the access of power in one location. There needs to be accountability. So to that end, things have to change. But also, people, there needs to be some representation in different parts of the country for them to govern and to do. There are so many things that if people are given the 
privilege and the power to, to govern and do certain things in their communities and take initiative and ownership, we will see innovation. We will see amazing solutions. It doesn't have to come from the top, from the center, because nothing's coming from here. And so there are so many changes that need to happen. And hopefully, this is a step in the right direction. We have the momentum now. It has to be corrected now. Corrected or just recreated? I don't care. Okay. <laughs> 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 just, a, just a good constitution. That's what's yeah. needed. I think, and, and I'll just like very two very quick things. I think our constitution is still geared towards this single Buddhist nation, right? This is we're so much more than that. The constitution doesn't really speak to um, our Tamil sisters and brothers. It doesn't talk to uh, our Muslim sisters and brothers. It doesn't talk to the diverse number of religions and ethnicities in our country. And I think that's not the kind of constitution we want to leave behind for our young people, the children who are going to take over. And I think the second thing is, um, obviously, the, the, the amount of checks and balances, this unlimited amount of power that's given to the president where they cannot even be tried in a court. Uh, this is not the kind of constitution that's... It, our constitution is designed for a world that's so different now. I think that's the same case in many countries where the constitution yeah. was designed almost 50, 100 years ago. The world has changed so much. The way we think, the way we live, uh, the composition of our country, how we think has changed. And I think the constitution needs to represent what our country is right now today and represent the voices of all communities in this country, not just sort of the Sinhala Buddhist majority because that's not what our country is about. Um, so I think that's... Um, that would be sort of my dream for a constitution, uh, a new constitution. I think that's uh, the constitution is the fundamental piece of paper or the, the, the book that it's referred to in terms of running what it's need to be run. Now, uh, we need to speak about leaders as we, we see many hashtags. You see the to let the president go, or let the family of the president go, then you even don't want the opposition. There's so much to speak about. But I really want to speak about then who or then what. Now that's what I want to ask them when we do come back. Welcome back to the show, our final segment. Now we have around 250 odd people and more who are in this thing called politics, front runners. Do the Sri Lanka today that you see out there raising a voice and holding placards with very bold statement, do you feel they want any one of them? I think there is a desire for a change of the political culture. And how, would you, how many politicians do we actually need in parliament to run this very small country? So I'm not going to get into the technicalities of what sort of constitution and right now 225 and this, there is a deep mistrust among the people for the political establishment. Regardless whether it's JVP, SJB or, or even SLPP, there is a distrust. You have failed us and that, that, that's there. And at the same time, the parliament doesn't represent the entire people. When you look at the less than 5% women in parliament, some of our greatest leaders in this country, you know, at least 50% of our greatest leaders should be there. Yeah. We, it, a country that doesn't give, let women have their rightful place is a country that's paralyzed. How are you going to be the country of the next generation when you're like that? So we need more women there. We need more young people there. All the young people who are there, very small number regardless, are family members and, and people who inherited a political seat, their father's seat or the mother's seat, and they came in. There are innovative, amazing young minds out there across the country. They want a chance. The problem is there is no campaign finance reform. So a young guy who has great ideas or a young girl who has great ideas wants to come forward. They can't compete with a million dollar budget on the right. other side. They can't afford to buy lunch packets and bottles of Iraq for random people. And they don't want to do that anyway, but they can't even have a proper campaign. Mm. And so now... And stages to speak and, you know, have... Yeah. They, you can't even put a basic ad online. So how are they going to win? So right now, for those who are watching, it's time for you to say, I want to invest in a young generation of leaders. Who are these people? They can never win because of the finances. That's the only thing that's keeping them away. They have the competence. They have the compassion for the people. They have Knowledge, a clear education. vision. Yeah. They're amazing people. So why don't we identify them? And then secondly, for true change to happen, we need to make sure we want to see campaign finance laws. We want to see a de public declaration of assets every year. We want to ensure that you are held accountable to results. You said these, we want to see progress. In any company, if you're not performing in your company, you're fired. But we allow these career politicians 
50 years, 40 years, no results, they're still there and living off the people. Why do you deserve to have all these privileges when you haven't performed? Just imagine the Sri Lanka cricket team decides from today onwards, the cricket team will be replaced by our children and our children's children, that's it. They don't even get selected. Some of our greatest cricket players, their children, some of them don't make it to the national team because they're not good enough to compete. But when it comes to politics and the political culture, oh no, my son can come next or my daughter can come next. They are not good enough. They don't represent the best of us. We need to create that culture. And when that happens, when you truly create a meritocracy, I think we are on the right path for true transformation. What is your take on it? I think what Prashant said, I think the first point about campaign financing, this is, this is what is going to create that equal playing field. For, every, for everyone. For everyone who has the competence, who has done grassroots work, who understands the district and community run for both provincial elections, because there's so much you can do at a provincial level too if the right restructuring is done and mm. also general elections. And how hard is it to register a party? Is it hard? Mm. Currently, the Election Commission takes about four to five years to review uh, a party's yeah. application. Candidates. Oh, so, all oh right, okay. So That's there's a, a lot time. of bureaucracy and red tape around that as yeah. well, even if young people want to come together and create a party or any, anybody wants to run for office. And I think campaign financing is what is going to really change the playing field and bring these young people who want, there are people who want to run. I mean, from my experience of working with young people across Sri Lanka, there are so many young people who have run for elections. If you go to golf, you will meet so many young people who actually True. run for office and lost. Not because they're incompetent, not because they're not talented, not because they don't have a grassroots presence. Their messages couldn't penetrate exactly. to the people. Yeah. Like, we would have never even seen yeah. their faces. Yeah. These are big budget campaigns. These are huge S amounts of money. Sorry to interrupt, but you know what's affecting all of us today is when we have to pay a bill, when we have to pump fuel, when we have to buy something to eat, when we have to go shopping. This is everyday life that's affecting us today, now, at this very moment. Can Sri Lanka come back at any time in the near future in terms of IMF coming in, let's say the whole go to, gum, go, to go home gamma is moved and like there's tourism moving in little by little. How long do you estimate for people to even buy a buck packet without stressing too much about it? First of all, I don't think go to go gamma is stopping tourism. Just no, 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 <laughs> I'm just saying yeah. the concept of yeah, go to yeah. go gamma moving in moving out and understanding, okay, we are on the right track, let's, now let's see, we are looking at a change. Yeah. I'm just saying, with all of this going back to, let's say how it was yeah. a month ago, how country was, let's say, yeah. but now things are just three times the price. Yeah. How long would it take for us to go back to what it was? Yeah. We just had an interview with uh, Dr. Indrajit Kumaraswamy and I asked him the same question, when will we have some sort of normalcy again? He said, best case scenario, we're talking about a year of lots of pain and things are about to get worse. Our electricity bills are going to triple in price, maybe quadruple. Um, fuel is going to continue to go high. Cost of living is going to, inflation will even grow higher. And so that's a result of so many bad decisions, especially in the last two years, we could have done something different. So there will be pain, but if we make the right steps now, maybe in a year or so, there, there we can have that turning point. Do you think our dollar rate will get better? In we're, looking context at, we're looking at 320 today, right? There's a ways away. Many economists won't say this is like an overnight fix or even a year fix. Some people say when you hit this kind of economic depression, it's about a decade of you know, a shock to the system. That doesn't mean things are going to be horrible for a decade, but there's going to be a year of pain, maybe a little bit more. That's what economists are predicting. And so, but we have made fun, a lot of mistakes economically as well over the years. You know, out of 74 years of budgets presented in parliament, We've had a budget deficit 70 times. Only four times we had a budget surplus. So we were spending more than we had. And we didn't in encourage more production in the country. We didn't create systems where innovative entrepreneurs and production people could, could thrive. Yeah. A and as a result, we're, we're struggling now. So now we have to encourage entrepreneurs. We have to help them build this. And there was a boom of that in 2018, 2019. We saw a lot of people taking challenges and leaving their eight to five jobs and like moving on and creating their dreams a reality. But then it's not all crippled with the bomb and it sort of really like brought them yeah. to a standstill. And now it's really showing. Um, I, I, we have to wrap the show, but I want to ask you before we go, what is your hope for tomorrow? 
what would you like as an immediate change that will have a long term benefit i think for me i'm i'm looking at sort of besides sort of what's happening with the imf the restructuring of our debt i think at least in the next 5 years there are sort of these four areas we need to focus on one is our tax system is a mess our income tax is a mess we're not taxing the people who should be taxed our mm. tax collection is a mess there's so much revenue that should be coming into the country that we're not collecting it in the right way that should be fixed secondly our tourism our our, our tourism our, our our website let's start on our website our website is a holy mess we are expecting we assume goa government is preventing us from uh, bringing tourists in no our entire tourism sector is a mess we need to fix that thirdly how are we going to bring dollars in how are we going to increase remittances <coughs> sri lanka has an amazing technological talent pool in this country that we are not making the best use of how do we bring a large number of foreign projects into our country uh, both our tech talent and our design talent we have a huge amount of design talent in this country that people don't realize these are dollars that people are bringing in how do we make that uh, environment thrive and i think the fourth thing as we've always said is education we need to prep our students uh, are eligible all of our students get ready for a very change very dynamic very different job market which we are not doing um so i think those uh, sort of these four areas for me at least it should be priorities in the next sort of five years mm. yeah just to build off what kavin they were saying i would also say that we have an amazing resource of 3 million sri lankans who live in the diaspora and a lot of them still are in love with our country mm. and are looking for ways to engage and contribute i believe that if the diaspora comes in our debt is not even a problem you know there is that much wealth there you know some of these people are some of the highest earning people in our country who left and who did very well for themselves in those parts of the world and we need to engage and understand how do we bridge that gap and how do we get them to invest again and there's enormous goodwill for the country so many countries have a soft spot for sri lanka they know we've had a tremendous tremendous potential but also so much bad luck as a country from tsunamis to civil wars to terrorist attacks and all that and there's a willingness to come alongside and support and so we need to build our foreign policy and those foreign relationships to a point that they see stability they see transparency they s- and as a result there's more investments coming in and then we need to identify these sectors that have been showing so much potential even in the midst of all this chaos if they were thriving like that in the midst of all this chaos give them the space to thrive we will have some world beaters here mm. and it's it, amazing i just saw this post about you know how in the midst of the great depression and and in the midst of so many financial meltdowns that's when some of the most innovative companies have emerged mm. and they're there give them the space encourage these people to lead us forward and at the same time there are so many opportunities in our education system to now rewire a new generation to think differently the values of national unity of justice of, of teaching these things at the school so they can't get brainwashed by a random media company that decides to go haywire and at the same time teach them the value of active citizenship ethics and all these things at school talk about where we went wrong in school have that part of the syllabus It's pointless learning only about the times of the kings and right. not talk about the mistakes of the past so we can learn from it definitely so we those are to, things we need to have parakram bahu in the subject but not only him yeah. that's what and so that we can yeah. learn because yeah. one historian once said if history is taught as one thing is that we don't learn from history, history. And, and we have to make sure our children learn from the mistakes we made so that they will not make those mistakes and that's why it's documented for us to learn <laughs> uh thank you so much for being here um as someone who represents the generation that was born in the 80s the 90s we are born into the war we were born into an era where our opportunities were trimmed they were cut they were stopped they were forced to be thought different it's time that we stand up for our sake the three of us here we fall into that category we represent so many of you who have either left this country because you have got so frustrated or you have been in this country and now going through depression uh mentally emotionally even financially um our generation in my opinion we have we have been the type who have seen it all let's use this platform to actually enjoy and see the betterment for our country we should not be in a place where we need to think before buying a laptop that we are going to use for something that we are going to work we should be just looking at he says ah oh, it's just a resource that is where we need to come we need to create that opportunity for everyone in this country from colombo all the way to like 
I don't know, Muladeev and wherever. So let's all work towards it. And I'm so happy that there are young leaders like you. Even if you lead a community that is just two people who are willing to see a change, I think that's the impact that we need to create. Those t two people can just speak to the world. Thank you for what you guys do. And I'm so honored that you all were on this show and keep growing in everything that you do. Um, I know protests may not be uh, everyone's cup of tea, but the message of what we are looking at in creating for Sri Lanka is everyone's dream. So let's not forget about the goal. Let's all hope for a better Sri Lanka. And thank you so very much for joining us on Date with Danu. I hope you got an insight and a different opinion to it. We will see you with another cool episode. Till then, you keep smiling. It's right.